Okay, so we're on to chapter seven. This is only part of A2, and this is the simplex algorithm. Now, the simplex algorithm is probably seen as one of the more challenging parts of D1, so you're going to need to have your concentration turned up to absolute maximum here. So in chapter six, the only, only linear programs that we were able to solve had actually only got two decision variables that were usually just X and Y. And this was because two decision variables could be represented on a 2D graph. Three variables becomes a 3D representation, and beyond three variables, becomes impossible to visualize. So that's why chapter six, because it was all about graphical methods, was only thinking about two variables. And obviously loads of problems are going to be having way more than two decision variables. And so what the simplex algorithm does is it investigates the vertices of the feasible region until the objective function is maximized, essentially traveling from one to the next until it is found. So in this particular visual visualization that we've got here, it represents a linear program, the, the region of it, a three-dimensional region, with three decision variables, with the red line showing the path that the simplex algorithm takes us on to find an optimal vertex. So it starts at one, it then goes to one that's near it, another one that's near it, and it keeps doing that until it has found the optimal value of the objective function that we've got here. And it's the same visualization if we were looking at a feasible region for two decision variables. It would go across to one of the vertices, and then it would maybe move up here until it found an optimal one. Or it's possible that it might go up along here and then it might come to this point in that kind of direction. But it always kind of traces out a particular route. That's kind of the logic of it. And it's also important to note that for the simplex algorithm, the place where you start has to be inside the feasible region. So this point here, the origin, is something that's inside the feasible region, and we'll be tackling things when it's not like that. So what we're going to do for exercise 7a, we're not actually going to do the simplex algorithm. We're going to do a bit of a recap about how we formulate some linear programs. So we're going to introduce something called slack variables that we need. And then we'll properly do the simplex method in exercise 7b and 7c. We learn about something called the two-stage simplex method in exercise 7d, and then the big M method from 7e. And pretty much they're all built on the simplex method itself, and they're all variations on that. And as usual, I will finish off the playlist with some exam questions as well. So let's just remind ourselves ourselves about how we do some formulating of linear programs that we've got here. And we're going to recap formulating these, but this time we're going to have more than two decision variables just to kind of introduce us to that kind of new style that we might be asked these questions. Now the likely variables to use will just be this kind of the end of the alphabet. You may use x1, x2, x3, x4. That's where you have subscript numbers, or you may have the same thing, but instead of subscript numbers, you have subscript letters like this one. So really it's just going to be a complete recap of what we did in chapter six. So I'm not going to spend too long on this one, and then I will talk about slack variables as well. So in order to supplement his diet, Andy wishes to take some Vitatab, Weldo, Extramin, and Yestavit tablets. Unsurprisingly, they've gone for something that's easy letters, so we have V, W, X, and Y. Amongst other ingredients, the contents of vitamins A, B, C, and iron in milligrams per tablet are shown in the table below. And he wishes to take tablets to provide him with at least 80, 30, 60, and 14 milligrams of vitamins A, B, C, and iron per day. Because of other factors, Andy wants at least 25% of the tablets he takes to be Vitatab, and wants to take at least twice as many Weldo as Yestavit. Don't know why he wants to do that, but it's just the constraints that we've been given. The costs of the tablets are 4, 6, 12, and 7 pence per tablet, and Andy wishes to minimise the cost. Formulate this as a linear programming problem. So to save me some time so you don't have to watch me writing this out, you must always make sure that you start at the beginning. If they haven't told you what each letter is going to represent, <coughs> you do need to say that at the beginning. So I've said, let VWXY be the number of VitaTab, Weldo, Extramin, and Yestavit tablets taken each day. Now, it is important to notice the fact that they have to say what it's really referring to. If you just said, let X, let VWX and Y be VitaTab, Weldo, Extramin, and Yestavit, it may not actually get the mark. They can be quite fussy with this. So make sure that you're reading in the context of the question what it is that these letters are actually going to be representing. And it's the number of tablets of each type taken per Per day. And I've also done some of these constraints here already. I'll just do the last few. So this is minimizing the cost. You can see that all of these numbers here are coming from the cost that we've got. And I've got these other subject to kinds of parts that we've got here. So Andy wishes to have at least 80 milligrams of vitamin A. So from a Vitatab, he gets 10 milligrams, 15 from Weldo, 25 from Extramin, and 20 from Yestavit, which is why I've said that if you multiply all of those things, it would be greater than or equal to 80 because he needs at least 80 milligrams. Same thing, these are the coefficients 
supplements for vitamin B, 10, 20, 15, and 15, and 20, 10, 15, and 20 go along here. And he needed 30 of the uh, vitamin B, 60 of vitamin C, and then 14 of the iron. You can see how these coefficients also correspond to this bit. So the last part that we want to kind of work out is this bit where it says, because of other, other factors, Andy wants at least 25% of the tablets he wants her to take to be Vitatab. So we're going to say that we want that the Vitatab tablets, we want them to be at least 25%, so greater than or equal to a quarter of all of the tablets that are being taken, which is V, W, X, and Y that we've got here. Now I'll multiply both sides by 4, so I get 4V and then V plus W plus X plus Y. And then I'm going to start talking to you about more of the standard way that we should be writing these kinds of things. And I've got this written down here. In order to do the simplex method, we should be in the habit of all inequalities being of the standard form like this, where all of the variables are, one, are on one side and the, um, the constant is on the other side. And you may like to add to your notes that obviously it could be in this particular form as well. Um, in fact, for the simplex, we do actually switch it around. So I might switch that around on the PDF just to make sure that we usually have it that way. But don't worry too much in this particular example. We standardly will have it in one of these two ways. So what I'm going to do is I will subtract the V so that I get 3V. In fact, I'll put it on here and I'll say it's coming down here. So it would be 3V uh, minus W minus X minus Y has got to be greater than or equal to zero for that particular one that we've got there, okay? And then the next one that we're going to look at was that he wants to take at least twice as many Waldo, uh, Weldo as Yestabit. So twice as many Weldo as Yestabit. Remember, that's where you would normally think, oh, it's going to be 2, W, and Y. But it's actually going to be the other way around. It will be the W and the 2, Y, because we want the Weldo to be twice as many of the Yestabit. And that wants to be at least twice. So W has got to be greater than or equal to 2, Y. Putting it in that standard form that we're going to have, we're going to have W minus 2, Y is greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to write it as W minus 2y has got to be greater than or equal to 0. And don't forget, we need our non-negativity constraints. That's v, w, x, and y have all got to be greater than or equal to 0. So we've got those constraints that have been added in, and we're now getting into the habit of having all the constants on one side. In this case, it makes sense with them like this. When we do simplex, they're always going to be written with this less than or equal to sign. Um, maybe Are they? I think they are. Yeah, let me just, I, I won't confirm that, but you'll get into the habit of that as we go, okay? So what we're going to have a look at now is this concept of there being slack variables. Now, slack variables are so that we can actually change our inequalities. They've got to be ch changed into equations. And in order to do that, I'm sorry, the reason we need to do that is because the simplex algorithm relies on inequalities being transformed into equations, okay? And we do this using something called slack variables, which we usually use the part of the alphabet that comes before the variables that we tend to use for the decision variables because slack variables are less important so we have r s t and u are kind of our standard letters that we would be using for this one that we've got here okay and what they do is they take up the spare capacity um we use the we do the using the slack variables to take up the spare capacity. So I'm going to get rid of that word absorb because that doesn't really make sense. Um, and they absorb that spare capacity that we have in that case. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rewrite this particular inequality that we've got as an equation using a slack variable. Now, if you've not heard of the word slack before, it means like the unused part of something. It's kind of like the spare part of something that you might have. So what we're going to do is add a variable in to kind of make this become an equality. So let's say, suppose, for example, that the x plus 3y plus 5z was only equal to 20, we would have to add something in to change this into an equation. Um, so we would actually need to add a 3 to it. So we would have to add x plus 3y plus 5z, if that was equal to 20, we'd have to add a 3 to change it into an equation like this. But we don't know that it's equal to 20, we just know that it's equal to something. So I'm going to add that r is this extra slack variable that changes it from being an inequality into something that is now an equality because of this extra r that has been added in. And it's important to note that if this was a constraint, we would now have to say that x, y, z and r have all got to be greater than or equal to zero. And that's just the case of how things have to work for um, the simplex method that we're going to be doing.
So we're now just going to try this for these two inequalities that we've got written here. We're going to write them as equations using slack variables. Each one will need its own slack variable. So the first one is just going to be x1 plus 5x2 plus 2x3 plus 2x4. And it's now going to have an extra slack variable r that would be able to fill up that gap if it was if it was less than 12. We could add r onto it so that it actually becomes equal to 12. And our second one, which is 3x1 minus 2x2 plus 4x3 minus 5x4, we would add on a different slack variable, which is s, which means it's equal to 7. So just to say that one more time, if these four terms, say, added up to 6, then the slack variable would add on as 1 so that it would equal 7 rather than just being less than or equal to 7. And again, if we were going to be writing um, the non-negativity constraint, it would have to be x1, x2, x3, 4, r and s, everything has to be greater than or equal to zero. We are not allowed to let anything be negative when we do these kinds of things. So you might like to go and have a go at exercise 7a. It's pretty much just re-practicing some of these things that we've already done in chapter six, and then a little bit about some stuff to do with slack variables. And then in the next video, we are actually getting on to the simplex method.